Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning. So, um, we have been talking about the new Hollywood movement and the important names associated with it. In our, na in our last class, we talked about various important factors that influence the growth and spread of uh, this very important movement of new Hollywood. Uh, according to many critics and film experts, this was the best time Hollywood cinema ever had or even world cinema ever had. This was the culmination of all the great movements that have been taking place um, in Europe, in Japan and in other parts of Asia and in the, new Holly, in the new Hollywood movement, we saw the culmination, the peak of the various experiments by way of themes and techniques taking place. So, um, uh, we have been talking about the various important names and you might recall we talked about um, BBS uh, and the, the produ uh, production company that had produced a number of experimental and avant-garde films. We also talked about the decline and fall of the studio system and also the star system which existed which was uh, celebrated for a while at least in Hollywood. Uh, we must also note that this was the period when great cinema was made throughout the world. So, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Japan, Sweden and Latin America, all these names and all these countries were producing very significant, significant works of cinema. The key players of course were Ingmar Bergman, Akira Kurosawa, Michelangelo Antonini and Federico Fellini. Uh, apart from all this, British cinema was also quite an influence on the American new wave. We have already talked about the British new wave cinema and one important film of that period was Alfie. Now, Alfie made in 1966 is uh, with Michael Caine playing the title role Alfie who is a charming rogue. He is good looking and he knows how to seduce women. women. He is also from the working class. So, we have been talking about cinema representing the working class young men uh, in Britain uh, when we talked about British new wave cinema. Now, Alfie is immoral, but at the end it turns out the uh, damage he inflicts is more on himself and less on the women he uses and disposes. This was the 60s take on feminism. Though Elfie was not the first British representation or portrayal of male behavior, the 60s had also seen uh, you might recall films such as Look Back in Anger, Saturday Night and Sunday Morning, A Kind of Loving and Billy Liar. So, we have talked about these films at length when we were discuss, uh, discussing British New Wave cinema. In spite of this, Keynes Elfie is remarkable for uh, his portrayal of nastiness and immorality. Elfie was recently remade with Jude Law, but according to many film experts, this was a very watered down, toned down version of the original Elfie. So, here is a scene from Elfie, watch it, watch it for the, uh, the hero's uh, characterization and also for the technique breaking the fourth wall. So, you must have noticed that how um, Michael Caine's character constantly talks to the camera. This is known as breaking the fourth wall. This was introduced to or uh, rather, uh, rather than using the word introduced, I would say it was quite perfected by Jean Liu Godard in Breathless and later on uh, Woody Allen has made this technique quite his own. Now, indeed when the studios uh, collapsed, the doors were wide open and uh, people with fresh ideas could just walk in. Anyone uh, who had some experience uh, in making a short film or training from a film school had big chances of making it uh, uh, big and successful in Hollywood. Producers were now ready to take risks. 
Why? Because they knew that the old idea and the old methods were not working anymore. This was uh, now uh, what was so special about this kind of cinema, uh, new Hollywood cinema? One important thing by way of uh, plot was that uh, the heroes were not investigating a big case. So, it was no longer the Humphrey Bogart kind of a great detective, okay, charismatic detective. So, there was nothing to investigate, there were no women to love. Okay, so, that, that uh, the essentially good man and good woman, that kind of era was more or less over. There were no goals and more importantly, the affirmative consequential model, you know, cause and effect model was replaced by open endedness. New wave cinema was also marked by a streak of social defiance, ambiguous characters and as far as heroes were concerned, there was a shift from um, classic mode, where heroes were morally motivated. Now, the new wave hero was no longer morally motivated. Consider for example, the heroes of Easy Rider and the heroes, the hero of Five Easy Pieces. Okay. So, you know, they were definitely not the heroic heroes. Okay. They were the drifters, the misfits, people who would not take responsibilities for their action and that was the period. So, they captured the zitgist of that era. So, that was the first wave and then Hollywood entered its second new wave and which was another um, great period for American cinema. This was the time um, when we got films such as A Clockwork Orange, Clute, The Last Detail, Paper Moon, The Exorcist, American Graffiti, The Conversation, The Godfather, Nashville, Carrie, Annie Hall and Star Wars. Now, one of the key names associated with the second wave Hollywood was Francis Ford Coppola. Coppola attended film school at UCLA. Prior to The Godfather, Coppola had made You Are a Big Boy Now, Finian's Rainbow and Rain People, which was a road movie. One of the forerunners or frontrunners of the new Hollywood cinema, he um, uh, came into the li limelight when he won an Oscar for the screenplay for Platoon, which is a war movie, re um, uh, which released in 1970. As far as uh, The Godfather was concerned, he was not interested in a big budget production and also adaptation. It was based on a Mario Puzo, um, Puzo's novel, bestseller, a Pulp Fiction and he was not uh, uh, impressed at all. Rather, he considered himself an artist. He was into new wave and fell in like most um, others of his generation. His ambition was that of building of Zotrop, that is an alternative studio. He always thought big and talked big. Now, coming to The Godfather, when eventually Coppola agreed to uh, direct the film, um, he tried to bring about several changes. And, uh, Mm, one big change was by way of screenplay, where he tried to cut down uh, the flab and uh, decided to stick to uh, the character of the Godfather and his immediate family. So, in the Godfather, in Coppola's Godfather, we are introduced to Vito Corleone, the Don, as played by the magnificent Marlon Brando. Uh, Don's family, and particularly Michael Corleone, uh, as played by Al Pacino, and uh, Perhaps uh, some of you might be aware that Coppola had to put up a real fight to get Al Pacino for that role, because the studios, particularly Robert Evans, the producer, he they were keen on um, um, casting someone who is already established, someone like Robert Redford. But uh, Al Pacino, uh, Al Pacino was not the first choice, not a very popular choice, but Coppola decided to stick to him. And uh, of course, we all know the results. So, we are introduced to uh, Michael Corleone, who refuses to become a gangster. He is an army man and we first see him wearing his um, uh, army uniform as he enters with his waspish girlfriend as played by Diane Keaton. In the memorable open, opening sequence, the Don meets people from his community and you might, uh, if you have seen the movie, you would recall that uh, 
there is a stark contrast between the lighting of the interiors and the exteriors. The studio was also not in favor of ca the casting of Marilyn Brando, but then uh, Coppola wanted Brando at any cost and Brando went through a great physical transformation. He puffed up his cheeks with uh, cotton, he stuck cotton, he stuffed his cheeks with cotton and he, uh, he uh, used a certain you know characteristic draw uh, that we are by now all familiar with Melon Brando's the godfather's talk and his voice. So, Brando went through great deal of preparation for that this role because he, he would he also wanted to be a part of this film, but he had to go to the screen test and uh, so did the rest of the cast and most of them were from the New York Methodist School of Acting. Now, uh, for instance, James Kahn, Diane Keaton, uh, Al Pacino and Robert Duvall. So, Brando was one of the, uh, was the only big star on the sets when the movie started. Now, in the memorable opening sequence, the Don meets several people from his community. As you all remember, it opens in the dark interiors of the Don's study, where he is trying to help someone in trouble. At the same time, in the lawns outside, his daughter Connie's marriage ceremony is in progress. And you might recall how, what a stark contrast there is between the lightings of the two sequences. So, the dark claustrophobic world of the godfather, uh, when he plays the part of his part of uh, the dawn and when he is a family man, he is something else altogether. So, the contrast is well brought out through uh, the uh, camera effects, the cinematography and uh, the direction. Now, the characters as you know in the godfather, they are not conventionally good or bad, rather a strong sense of ma moral ambiguity pervades throughout. Um, the key theme of the film is individual's con uh, conflict with himself and the society he lives in, thus raising the questions of guilt, responsibility and loyalty as you might have seen in Al Pacino that is Michael Corleone's character. He starts off as something else and ends up becoming something else altogether. Also, remember it is a world of authoritarian patriarchy. Women do not have much of a say in this world. We do not even know um, the name of the godfather's wife. The godfather is also remembered for its atmosphere and ambience. After all, to recreate the forties meant organizing the period cast sets, restaurants. You might recall the famous restaurant scene when Michael Corleone guns down a corrupt cop his very first murder and uh, the restaurant is recreated uh, in order to mimic the forties. The clothes, the cars and the streets, all these were painstakingly uh, developed. Uh, the film was uh, phot uh, photographed by Gordon Willis um, and much of the film is shot in closed spaces and dark shuttered rooms giving a feeling of claustrophobic world of the godfather of, of Don Corleone. The memorable lines we all know and uh, uh, the dialogues have become a part of our collective consciousness. I will make him an offer he cannot refuse. I believe in America, that is my family K not me. Do not ever take sides against the family and uh, one with uh, an abiding universal wisdom. The man who comes to you to set up a meeting, that is the traitor. Here is a scene, the opening scene from The Godfather. Watch it. You might have recall, uh, you might have noticed how dark and claustrophobic the entire scene is and also of course, the opening line I believe in America, the godfather at some level is also an indictment of the great American dream. The godfather is a trilogy, uh, there is a gap of two years between the first and the second godfather where the two great method actors were brought together although they never come face to face. Robert De Niro who plays the young Vito 
and El Pacino who is who now assumes the mantle of uh, Don. He is Don Corleone and now Michael is now Don. At the end of the second part of the film we find Michael sitting alone in a chair in his lawn and the rot in his soul is evident on his face which embodies also the corruption, the decay of the American story, the success story and also the downfall or the disillusionment with the American dream as well. For more about the 70s and the making of the Godfather, I suggest you read Robert Evans, The Kid Stays in the Picture. It is a wonderful film, it is a documentary as well as a book. The Kid Stays in the Picture by Robert Evans. Kapula's next movie was uh, an ambitious venture. Um, I am talking not about the conversation, but about Apocalypse Now. Now, loosely based on Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, the film's dark hearted tale is unsurpassed as it follows an undercover US Army uh, officer as played by Martin Sheen sent from Saigon in Vietnam to assassinate a power crazed special forces colonel as played by Marlon Brando, who has flipped and set himself up in his own native kingdom deep in the Cambodian rainforest. Now, Apocalypse Now was a bloated epic, it went over budget mainly because of Coppola's obsession with perfection. It, he tried to give it an extremely psychedelic and surrealistic treatment. Observe for instance, the opening shots with uh, um, Martin Sheen and, uh, and in his drug induced state. Kapula was very clear what he wanted and what he want, how he wanted Apocalypse Now to look like. The jungle will look psychedelic, fluorescent blues, yellows and greens, the war is essentially a Los Angeles expo like acid rock. That was what he wanted to capture on screen. Here is a scene with Robert Duell. I love the smell of napalm in the morning, famous scene from Apocalypse Now, please watch it. Roman's, uh, Roman Polanski's uh, Chinatown is another seminal film of this period starring Jack Nicholson, um, the great director John Huston, Faye Dunaway and it was produced by Robert Evans. It is uh, now memorable for its several lines, but uh, more, most importantly forget it Jake, it is Chinatown. Okay, so, that is the tagline that is the moral of the story. It was um, f one of the first neo-noir and revisits the classic noirs of the 40s. Basically, the theme deals with the land grabbing in California set during the 30s and the 40s. Here is a scene from Chinatown, please watch it. Martin Scorsese is yet another great um, director of that period along with Coppola, Brian De Palma and Woody Allen. He is one of the most influential directors of that period who is uh, still making very interesting films. Scorsese was born in Little Italy, New York in 1942 and studied at NYU where he also taught films for a short while. Uh, it is the presence of religion, a key element of Scorsese's signature that sets him apart. He was basically turned off by church dogma and remained under, but still he remained under the spell of Catholic ritual and iconography. Along with Coppola and Fran uh, Woody Allen, he is the most significant name associated with the new wave Hollywood. His uh, influences included the cinema of Ingmar Bergman and films such as Alan Rennes, Hiroshima, Mon Amour, On the Waterfront and East of Eden both by Alaya Kazan, Giant last year at Mariaba and The Misfits. He idealized directors as varied as John Ford, John Huston, Howard Hawks, Frederico Fellini, 
Trufa, Godad, Rene, Antoninini, Rosalini and Michael Powell. His other influences include, the, uh, include films such as uh, uh, The Searchers, The Red Shoes, Citizen Kane and 400 Blows. He is a keen cinephile uh, and he often discusses films. You can watch uh, a number of uh, uh, his interviews and also the documentaries that he has been associated with, documentaries on cinema. Most importantly, uh, some, uh, one uh, titled uh, person, Personal Journey with Martin Scorsese, which is his take on the great cinema, the great classics of yesteryears. Um, his uh, first well known film is Who is That Knocking at My Door, starring Harvey Keitel, which is an essentially um, a very personal film. Mean Streets, his major his first major success explores the doctrines of the Catholic sect, which believed in the idea of guilt and being unworthy. He poses the question in the film, can you really be a saint in this day? In the spring of 1973, Scorsese's budget did not allow to shoot an ev everything in New York as he wanted to. The interiors of mean streets were shot in Los Angeles and the crew had only a week to do the exteriors in the sit streets of Little Italy where he grew up. The residents took objections at the title Mean Streets because they did not like the title uh, and they felt it referred to their street. A deeply personal coming of age film Mean Streets was noted for its rough documentary quality and also its philosophy embodied in Charlie's conviction, Charlie as played by Harvey Keitel, that penance comes from action in the street and not in the church. Here is uh, the opening shot from Mean Streets and watch it for the um, home video effect and the documentary like feel of the film. Scorsese's uh, extremely significant film is Taxi Driver, which followed Mean Streets. Paul Schroeder, the screenwriter, based Travis Bickle, that is played by Robert De Niro, on the unnamed man from Dostoevsky's Notes from the Underground. Travis's state of pseudo masochism, schizophrenia, paranoia are underscored by the absence of domestic life of any kind lack of connection, connection with fellow uh, cab drivers and the constant voiceover that tells us what is in his head, but fails to get communicated. Uh, we have already done in one of our previous lectures a clipping from Taxi Driver and the close up shot of uh, Robert De Niro's eyes and the opening scene. So, here you should recall that, that he constantly talks to himself by way of voice over, but he is one of the most incommunicative ca characters. Controversial at the time of its release, Taxi Driver is today regarded as a classic for its treatment of alienation, urban malay and exploration of dark arena of human psyche. Now, uh, Scott says he from the beginning of his career, he, he had made his passion for world cinema obvious. Over the years, his love of cinema has taken the form of constant concern to preserve and transmit um, his inheritance. In 1979, he started sensitizing the film industry about the dangers to which American films shot in color since the 1950s were exposed. The Eastman process, which had replaced Technicolor, quickly degrades both as negatives and as projection copies. Scorsese conducted a successful campaign for the preservation of these films and established good relations with Eastman Kodak. Scorsese is also a collector of cinema. At first, he accumulated thousands of video cassettes, employing an assistant to record and classify this collection, which was suddenly enlarged by the appearance of, by the appearance of cable TV. We move on to talk about the next great filmmaker of this period, Woody Allen. 
Now, Woody Allen uh, is also again like Coppola constantly associated with Gordon Willis, the cinematographer who passed away recently. Mm, his career took off with Annie Hall and uh, um, he, his association with Gordon Willis also started with Annie Hall. Together they collaborated on eight films together and they have created two visual masterpieces Manhattan and Zelig. Um, Woody Allen's cinema is also notable for the use of its narrative. One of the best examples of innovative narrative is Annie Hall and the techniques that he uses in the films include breaking the fourth wall, uh, mixing the past and present, uh, characters speaking in asides to the camera or complete strangers in the film using subtitles that contradict the action and also some occasional use of animation. Breaking the fourth wall is a very common device as we have already seen in Elfie and before that we know Jean-Luc Godard. And uh, uh, this is uh, one of the major contributions of Woody Allen, the narrative of, uh, also of course, his films are brilliantly acted also and most of the actors who work with Woody Allen, they end up getting the highest recognition for their actings. Uh, I would also like to mention the uh, works of Alan J. Pakula, who is remarkable for his political kind of cinema. So, uh, one major film is Clute, which was made in 1971, Parallax View starring Warren Beatty in 1974, All the President's Men, which is based on a non-fiction in 1976 and uh, his later works include Presumed Innocent and The Pelican Brief starring Julia Roberts. Pakula's political thrillers are remarkable for its skillful characterization and a paranoid sense of conspiracy. Uh, in the noirish clute, again which is a neo-noir, the detective starts a romantic relationship with a call girl as played by Jane Fonda, who is the killer's the mysterious killer's next probable victim. In all the President's men, he uses a docudrama style to uncover the Watergate scandal that took place during President Nixon's time. In Parallax View, Pakula uses abstract images of large spaces with giddy heights in order to capture the sense of paranoia. Here is a scene, a monta the montage scene from Parallax View, watch it. I have been talking about the great directors, but I have uh, no discussion of the uh, second new wave can uh, be complete without a mention of the great actors of this time. This is the time when we, uh, when we had the greatest actors of all time and uh, they are associated with something called the method acting, the method is school of acting. This is the time when new ways of filmmaking made it necessary to uh, have newer approaches towards acting. Now, um, according to Orson Welles, he says, I am always making fun of the method, but I use a lot of things that are taken from it. So, such is the impact and influence of a method. The prime exponent of this school of acting was the Russian theatre director um, Stanislavski and this was known as the Stanislavskian system which held that an actor's main responsibility was to be believed. Stanislavski first employed methods such as emotional memory. The method believed in preparing for a role that involves fear. The act, uh, for example, the actor must remember something frightening and attempt to act the part in the emotional space of that fear they once felt. In the US, the Stanislavski system became popular as the method. First made uh, popular by the group theatre in New York City in the 1930s in the US. And some of the stellar names associated with Lee Strasberg uh, along with Stella Adler and Utah Hagen. They were the most well known proponents of the approach. The method was a clear break from previous modes of acting that held that the actor's job was to become the character and leave their own emotions behind. 
The creation of physical entries into these emotional states believing that the repetition of certain acts and exercises could bridge the gap between life and off the stage was one of the key features of the method. The new group of actors included names such as Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, Jack Nicholson, Dustin Hoffman, Faye Dunaway, Gene Hackman, Harvey Keitel, Robert Duval, Jane Fonda and also Meryl Streep. Here is a scene from Dog Day Afternoon starring Al Pacino and watch this scene. Other great films and filmmakers of this period include Peter Bogdanovich, uh, whose uh, most memorable film is The Last Picture Show. The film's tagline said it all, Anarin, Texas, 1951, nothing much has changed. A scene takes place outside uh, town at the tank, a pond that briefly breaks the monotony of the flat Texas prairie. The protagonist Sam takes his friends fishing there even though there is nothing in the tank but turtles. But Sam however does not like fish, does not like to clean them, does not like to smell them. He goes fishing for the scenery. The film focuses on the desert, dry lives, desperation and loneliness of the people in a small town. Um, the film introduced stars such as Jeff Bridges and Sybil Shepherd to cinema and was photographed in beautiful black and white, almost like you know harking back to those older times. William Friedkin's The French Connection is another monumental film of that time. It is a fact based thriller about a drug ring busted up by the NYPD and it is adapted from a novel by Robin Moore. Friedkin followed a traditional linear narrative and also inserted a car chase scene following the success of Bullet uh, starring Steve McQueen. The French connection expressed his admiration for the French masters. Fritkin had also seen the film, uh, the Greek film Z, um, which is a film by, uh, directed by Costa Gravis and he wanted to you make a political thriller in a documentary using a documentary technique uh, just like Z. So, he captured street reality and gave the film a loose handheld documentary like feel. He was also influenced by Diabolic and Wages of Fear both by the French master Henri Georges Clouseau. Fritkin had grown up on films such as Citizen Kane and Psycho and, real, and like most other new wave Hollywood directors admired European films such as Blow Up. Juliet of the Spirits, La Goa Effini and A Hard Day's Night. According to William Fritkin, the plotted film is on the way out and is no longer of interest to a serious director. A new theatre experience is under 30 and largely interested in abstract experience. The idea is that newer people, the younger people want newer experiences and newer kind of cinema with a distinct newer kind of cinematic language. Fritkin is also known for his horror The Exorcist, which uh, um, was motivated by uh, Fritkin's envy of uh, Coppola and the monumental success of The Godfather. He said that a good part of my motivation was to make a better film than Francis's. The novel on which The Exorcist is based on seemed unfilmable and um, things such as scenes such as levitations and poltergeists and possessions were difficult to show on screen. It was also surrounded by controversies, but he made it and exercises is today a horror classic. George Lucas is also another important filmmaker of that time. He came into the limelight with a sci-fi film THX set in the 25th century. Lucas realized that every film in the last 10 years had pointed out how terrible we are, how wrong we were in Vietnam, how we have ruined the world. I wanted to preserve what a certain generation of Americans thought being a teenager was really about from 1945 to 1962. His response was thus American Graffiti in 1973, which is set in the 50s and is a nostalgic take on America's past. 
it portrays teenage rites of passages in a small town in the 1950s and stars Harrison Ford, Ron Howard and Richard Dreyfus. The plot is very flimsy, two schoolboys ready to fly out of their small town home. The film maps the universal fear of leaving the warm and known for something cold and unknown. Another great and landmark film of that period is Saturday Night Fever directed by John Badham. It's, uh, it uh, also is a rites of passage film and reworks the musicals of classic Hollywood period. John Travolta's character Tony Monero is a working class Italian American from Brooklyn, but on Saturday nights he is the king of the disco. He dresses up and goes to the discotheque 2001 Odyssey. The film had music and it was an enormously successful music by the Bee Gees and it also is credited for reinventing men's fashion. It also gave birth to the birth of the, uh, it also gave birth to the um, modern dance film such as Grease, Footloose, Dirty Dancing and its several imitations. One of the most successful period uh, films of this period was Steven Spielberg's Jaws. This is about a killer shark in a beach resort town and it follows a traditional narrative and its uh, uh, theme is very clear good versus evil good represented by the heroes who fight the killer shark. It is what most critics call a simplistic entertainment and Spielberg and Lucas together are credited for taking cinema back. Also remember Close Encounters of the Third Kind which is a 1977 film and Spielberg is quoted as I wanted to take a child's point of view, the uneducated innocence that allows a person to take this kind of quantum jump. We have to also consider the father figure in Lucas and Spielberg. Most families are fatherless, you know the absent father longing for and the kids grow up longing for the absent dad. Critics have read this as a nostalgia for authority. The plots in both Lucas and Spielberg, they are set in motion by the moral and emotional vacuum at the center of the home resolved by father surrogates. Um, one director whose film uh, sort of stands alone in this period is uh, Michael Simino's The Deer Hunter. This was a period when Vietnam and the war with America became a frequently occurring theme in Hollywood cinema. Some of these films are Coming Home by Hal Ashby, The Boys in Company C by Sidney Fury, Go Tell the Spartans by Ted Post and Coppola was also shooting Apocalypse Now in Philippines. The Deer Hunter is about the working class Russian Americans from Pennsylvania. The film starts with, starts with two rituals, the marriage of Steve. Uh, just lays a throwback uh, to uh, the extended wedding sequence uh, of The Godfather and a deer hunting trip before the protagonist enlists in the Vietnam War. The film then cuts to right into the middle of the war with the Americans uh, prisoners of war forced to play Russian roulette and depicts the gruesome realities of war. So, one of the greatest films of this period, Michael Cimino's career did not exactly take off the way Scorsese, Coppola, Brian De Palma and Woody Allen did, but he has made one great film of that period and it is definitely a film worth watching. The new Hollywood period thus started till the late 70s and it has left us with some of the most innovative films ever made. Um, I like to draw your attention to the reading list here. Uh, Christopher Gare's The American Counterculture, jo Godfrey Hodgson's America in Our Time, Charles Perry The Height Ashbury, Peter Biskin's Easy Riders Raging Bulls and David Thompson Iron Christie's Scorsese on Scorsese. So, these are some of the seminal books that you can refer to. Thank you very much.